Support for this program is provided by Minnesota Life College. Wondering about the next step after high school? At Minnesota Life College, young adults with learning differences and autism spectrum disorders learn to live independently. More information is at minnesotalifecollege.org. From Focal Point Radio and Radio Fairfax in Fairfax, Virginia, this is the Mimi Gerges Show. Most parents anxiously await the moment when their kids grow up, get a job, and move out on their own. For parents of autistic children, that might never happen. The CDC says that today, autism rates may be as high as 1 in 50 children. That will eventually be a lot of autistic adults. Glenn Finland is the mother of three adult boys. Her youngest is David, and he still lives at home. Glenn Finland has written a memoir about her son, her marriage, and the daily struggle to let go when living with a grown autistic son. The book is called Next Stop, and Glenn Finland joins me in the studio. Glenn, welcome to the program. Thank you for having me, Mimi. Why do you want people to know this story? I would like people to be able to look at my son and just see a regular guy. He perhaps um, presents a little bit differently from other people, but there are all kinds of ways of being human, and this is just one of them. When David was born, you already had your hands full with two very active little boys. When did you first notice that something was different about David? About four months. You know, this was my third son. I I knew something about little baby boys. And David was just too quiet. People called him a good baby, but those were people who didn't know him. They didn't know that he wasn't smiling or um, wide eyes or um, moving around enough. He was just too good of a baby. And you knew right away because you already had those two boys. A lot of parents are faced with autism on their very first child. And really, they they really can't tell. What's a baby supposed to do at four months? It's it's a fair thing to say. Um, I think uh, when parents, new parents, uh, get the first diagnosis, they run through a range of emotions. I think they, first of all, they're shocked and they have to mourn a little bit because they're sad. That it's not what they expected. And perhaps they feel like they and their baby um, has gotten a raw deal in life. So parents have to really come together at the beginning. And I think they often do with sort of a we can beat this attitude. It's interesting that statistics have shown that as children age, and uh, as the stressors change, as, as uh, marriages um, evolve, they, they find that as children become uh, adolescents and the behaviors become more challenging, and then the financial stressors and the uh, ever-watchfulness, the sheer eternalness of living with a child that you love with autism um, sinks in, then marriages can tend to unravel because the pressure is just too much. And when you see that this is a forever kind of situation, uh, it, it can marriages can take a hit. How was your marriage? Your, your husband, Bruce, seems like a really great guy. Yeah, 30 years and on. You know, why mess with perfect? <laughs> <laughs> but I think it is interesting that you were saying that the couple kind of pulls together, but then it's just so tiring, especially after they become adults. It's a constant uh, battle between um, backbone and, and collapse. I mean, you, you really have to struggle. And I, I must say, you can't do it alone, and you need a good partner. So if you can hold on to that marriage, there are, there's a lot of things that you can do. You really have to take care of. Of, of the love that you share with your partner because um, it's not exactly the, the same kind of love that, that brought you together, fun and uh, romance uh, that it started out with. You know, it's, it's a different kind of love, but you need each other. Autism manifests itself in many different ways. What are David's particular strengths and weaknesses? Mm, I like that question. I like the way you say strengths. Uh, the, the strongest thing that David has going for him is his... Um, physical well-being. He is a runner. He is a long-distance runner. In the book, I say he runs like a deer. And he didn't walk until he was about four years old. So this is, uh, this is no small thing. And he, um, that, that strength of his, his physical strength, is, is also something that um, helped me balance out the story of David because 
everybody in, in my family has strengths and weaknesses. And um, my oldest son is the smartest kid in the room. He's always been that way. My middle son is the sweetest kid in the room. He's the family balancer, I would say. And David is a beautiful runner. The book we're discussing is called Next Stop, An Autistic Son Grows Up. Glenn Finland is the author. She's also a former reporter, and she's in the studio with me. When did his older brothers notice that there was something different about their little baby brother? Well, you know, I think it was probably by the time that he was, uh, he should have been walking, uh, say at around two, two and a half, something like that. And of course, all of the talk around the kitchen table um, was different, and it was focused a lot on David with strange words like apraxia and static encephalopathy. Those aren't words that little boys understand, so they were confused by it. So um, there was a lot of therapy going on, and there were a lot of uh, doctor visits that the siblings kind of got pushed to the side over. I think they began to be aware of it then. And how did you explain it to them? Mm. I didn't understand it myself. Uh, David did not get his uh, diagnosis until age five, and I had to go look the word up. And I, I have mentioned that to other friends, parents of, of autistic kids, and they all say the same thing. And it makes me think, if I didn't have a child with autism, would I care? You know, it's a fair question. It's a fair question. We are all so busy as parents, and this idea of raising awareness for autism matters so deeply to me. It's such a big part of my life. But sometimes I, I have to step back and in all fairness think everybody's lives are busy and richly textured. You talk a lot in the book about how David's needs took you away from your other two boys. But really, what choice did you have? I didn't have a choice. What I, what I chose to do was to give more attention to the, the, the squeaky wheel. And I think I've paid for it in, in the years that followed because it's tough. It's tough on siblings. And um, so the, any advice that I could give is just from my own lived experience, and that would be to say, don't forget the siblings. Remember that they need a lot of attention. Don't neglect them. Don't ne be there for them if you can. There's hardly, I mean, you just use yourself up with your children. Every mother does, I think. But um, you have to kind of step back a little bit and, and remember the other ones because they're awfully brave. They're doing so much that, that um, uh, siblings with uh, what we call neurotypical, which is just regular kids, um, don't have to think about. But they, they grow up faster. So, Glenn, we talked about the marriage. We talked about the siblings. What about you? I mean, you had thought about after your kids grew up and went to school, you would go back to work. Were you able to do that? with well, David's special needs? Uh, not like I'd planned. No, no. My whole life changed, and um, in a good way. Uh, it made me an accidental noticer. I became much more observant as to all the differently abled people there are in the world and um, how we tend to, in our society, uh, perhaps marginalize those uh, who are differently abled. They become invisible in many ways. One issue with autism is lack of empathy. So... David doesn't necessarily sense what other people are going through. That would make it very difficult for other people to show empathy towards him. Exactly. It's the classic calling card for um, many people, but not all people with autism. Um, that's one thing that I've learned paying attention to um, people who have Asperger's. You know, it's, it's, they may appear not to have empathy, but empathy is there. It just doesn't show on a face the way it might show on my face or your face. So perhaps it's, it's our problem. <laughs> David also suffers from Tourette syndrome, jerky movements that he's not in control of. Is there a relationship between Tourette's and autism? No, there is not. These are two very separate disorders. Uh, but I must say that the Tourette's, which is a mean combination of uh, motor and verbal tics, has been his trailing beast because it causes people to stare, and good people stare. It's just human nature to stare at people who are different. So I've spent a lot of my life going up to people and saying, quit staring. You actually do that? I do. Because I was wondering, what do you do when other people are staring at your son? Well, first of all, I have to resist the opportunity to go up and choke them, give them a good choking. But um, 
sometimes I just find myself thinking, well, I can either take this home with a knot in my stomach or I can go over and say something. <laughs> I feel better when I say, quit staring. The book we're discussing is called Next Stop, An Autistic Son Grows Up. Glenn Finland is the author, and she's in the studio with me. What is the two-foot rule? The two-foot rule is David's way of saying, leave me alone. Don't touch me. Don't touch me. I, I need to be in my own quiet space. He does, especially does not like people touching him. Well, um, if you're going to approach David, if you want to uh, say, well done on something, stick out your hand and let him see you coming. There's no goosing. There's no, um, uh, you know, hard pat on the back. That, that makes him feel, it, make, it looks like he's snake bit when you do that. Is that typical for autism? That's a funny question to me as <laughs> there a isn't mother. A typical. Right, right. Because in, in my tribe, we say, if you've met one autistic kid, well, then you've met one autistic kid. Think snowflake instead. How did David do in school? What, what was your experience in school with him? I'm glad it's over because uh, it was a lot of spinning wheels. Uh, there were so many... Um, so much time spent in things like learning to multiply, just very abstract concepts or some literature uh, uh, ideas and, or talking about theories. And David thinks in very concrete terms. So uh, the abstract ideas uh, and language that is often used in the classroom would often leave him um, not paying attention, we'll say. He started out in public school in the special ed classes. You had a pretty bad experience with that in the beginning, didn't you? We did. We did. And then we switched to um, public or private school. And we thought that, uh, frankly, if anything's going to cost that much, it must be the magic pill. It must, it must work. But before you did that, I thought, I mean, it was pretty uh, shocking. Actually, you wrote in your book that one of the special ed teachers told you that your son just usually sits there and acts like a vegetable? That was the word she used, and I had to ask her to repeat it because it stunned me so much. But you know, um, Mimi, what that tells me is that uh, even our special ed teachers, and this was back in the 80s. No, excuse me, it was 1990. Uh, uh, even our special ed teachers are not well-trained enough. Autism is, is something that is just pervasive in our um, education system, but uh, our Teachers have not been trained well enough. It's, it's sort of a new way of thinking about teaching. And uh, clearly this woman, who had a good heart, used the wrong language. And it, it frightened me to the point of thinking, I have to do something better for my kid. Which led you to look for this really expensive private school. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And um, it was good. It, was, uh, uh, it, it attracted him as far as... Uh, first being able to run. There was a running team because it was along the river, the Potomac. The school was located along the Potomac. And so he was able to run with the team after, after school. And um, that opened up a whole lot of new avenues. So that part was good. We just couldn't afford it. And um, a, a psychologist that we were seeing sort of brought me up short one day because I realized that David was just sort of keeping a seat warm in the classroom. And the psychologist said, well, go ahead and take him out. And I said, you mean next year? This was February, I think. And he said, I mean next week. Save every penny you can because you're going to need it for what happens next. Because what happens next is the rest of his life. Do you recommend that to most parents? Our kids are growing up. And the problems that we have when they're small may be small. The problems that we're going to have face uh, as they get older are going to be there forever forever. So you're talking about health insurance, you're talking about rent, transportation, um, all of these things for the rest of your child's life. It really is nothing short of imagining another person's life. Glenn Finland is in the studio with me. She's the author of the memoir called Next Stop, An Autistic Son Grows Up. Support for this program is provided by Minnesota Life College. Wondering about the next step after high school? At Minnesota Life College, Young adults with learning differences and autism spectrum disorders learn to live independently. More information is at minnesotalifecollege.org. Glenn, there's something called special needs trust and limited guardianship. What is all that about? It's about 
taking some control of your child's future. It's about um, not being discouraged and being inspired to act because uh, the, the biggest monster under the bed for every parent of a special needs child is who will be there for my child when I am no longer here. Uh, my husband Bruce and I are both 35 years older than our son David. So we know that we're not going to be around when he is our age. Uh, so what will we do? A special needs trust will put into place protections for your, your special needs child that will um, protect him from um, being prey to people who might take advantage of, of the vulnerable in the future. It will also make sure that he is housed and um, uh, health insurance is provided for and a variety of other things. Um, in many families, um, you know, you look to the grandparents and their way of saying, I, I love the next generation is to write a big check. Well, in our family, the grandma <laughs> was a retired special education school teacher. So we had to do something to um, make sure that David would be safe. And we also wanted to take the burden off as much as we could of his older brothers who have signed on and told us they'll be there for him. What is limited guardianship? Because you said that you had to really fight to have him declared legally incapacitated. What's the benefit of that? Well, it makes sure that um, before David makes tremendously important life long decisions, um, he has to come to us for permission. We have to sign off on uh, the right to marry, the right to own a gun, the right to drive a car, and the right to vote. These are the four main things. And why is it such a, a problem to get that? You would think that the courts would want to give that right to parents. Well, in some ways, um, the ad litem, who is the attorney who takes um, David's side in, in this situation, uh, wants to be absolutely sure that you're not taking something away from the individual citizen because these are rights. We all have these rights as Americans, but, uh, you know, it's, it's the, um, the civil rights that we worry about, but it's also the um, being taken advantage of that we have to protect. There was a point where David signed a contract at a gym for $3,800 worth of personal training. This kid does not need a personal trainer. <laughs> That's exactly true. Um, that was a that was a rough rough time in in our marriage and and with David because David didn't realize what he had done. He had just signed a line, a dotted line. He said he's always had trouble with numbers. So the thirty eight hundred dollars could have meant thirty eight cents to him. And he's also very gullible. If somebody asks him for something, he's just going to give it to them. Well, yeah. He'll reach into his pocket. I think I opened the book with a, a moment where he and I are downtown at the uh, Portrait Gallery in D.C., and a, a homeless guy says, uh, you got some money? And David reaches into his wallet and says, how much? You worry in the book about David being lonely. Do you think that he feels lonely? You know, I, I think that's an interesting question, maybe because... Um, the one thing about the book is, the one thing that's missing from the book is David's voice. He is so unknowable that uh, my husband has put it this way. He says, sometimes um, I think you worry more about how you would feel if you were David than how David is really feeling. So just back off, leave him alone. But I, I worry about how, how alone he is. What mother could leave your kid alone, you know, and, and let that happen? So I don't really know the answer to that because he hasn't told me. Has is he able to read this book? Yeah, yeah. Um, I gave him the book, and he um, he kind of put it down and walked away and said, "You know, I don't care about these things, Mom." And I thought, <laughs> "Yes, of course I do. I certainly do know that." And then about six months later, I found him. Um, his one of his brothers, his middle brother, had come home for a weekend, and they were. <laughs> I found him. Um, in bed together, reading with a light, uh, reading the book, and laughing at parts, and, and just talking it over. So I, I just had to close the door. I had to leave them alone for that. There's a point where, um, a lot of points in the book, actually, where David just really surprises you. Because you you sometimes you feel like you really don't know him, even though you probably know him better than anybody. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. I would say that one of the biggest surprises was um, the day that the... Um, 
the piece that I wrote in the post came out on Mother's Day, and it was the seed kernel for the book. And it was about the summer that I had spent teaching David to ride the Metro solo and in the process, how he taught me to let him go. And that Mother's Day that the uh, piece was published, um, my son, older boy, Max, came home, and we were all sitting around the kitchen talking. And then David walked in, and he had said nothing about the piece, but he had uh, a dozen roses, and he threw them down on top of the stove and said, here, Mom. And I said, David, that's marvelous. And he said, you owe the lady at Safeway 20 bucks. <laughs> Glenn, you talked about how you were always kind of looking, especially in the early days, finding the, the right pill or that magic thing that was going to fix David. At what point did you let go of that notion? Gradually, slowly, because we all hope. Hope is so important, just moving forward in this. But um, at some point, I had to accept David for David and then begin enjoying who he is and sort of stepping back. And I've never felt like... um, blaming anybody for David's autism. I've never felt like it was a blessing. I'm not one of the people who say, you know, this makes me a better person. No, I don't feel like that at all. I just feel like it is what it is. And here we go, one step in front of the other. Part of that is, you know, college educated parents realizing that their autistic child is not going to grow up to be a professional like them. And that, you know, if they're able to work, which would be great, It's going to be in, you know, something like cleaning offices or doing things like that. Mm -hmm. That's sometimes hard for college-educated professional parents to accept. Yes, it is. Well, um, here's what David's doing right now. He has three part-time jobs. He's a dog walker. He's a ticket taker at Nationals Baseball Park. And he cleans buildings. He works harder than just about anybody I know. Do you feel like he's happy? Everybody would like to make more money. You know, I think, um, and I I suppose that's really where I would like to see all of this turn a little bit, turn the wheel if we could to um, what is needed, because I feel like um, if you break it down, probably uh, the strongest tool we have for improving sound mental health is a good job, competitive wages, meaningful employment. You describe a moment where um, David speaks at a hearing about the state which was about to cut jobs for, or the jobs program for for disabled individuals. What happened when David got up to speak? He found his voice. He really spoke up in a strong, booming voice, too close to the microphone. You know, uh, it (laughs) surprised me. Um, But um, he was angry, and I saw that emotion. It was very real. I was extremely proud of him that day. He had prepared notes that you'd helped him write, and he started with that, and then he just kind of threw it away. He went rogue. He went off. He said, you got to hire people like me. It's the right thing to do. And he was right. He knew what he was talking about. I thought it was interesting. He, he, he looked at them, and he said, you know, I work. I'm a volunteer, but I want to get paid like everybody else. Yeah, yeah. He watched his brothers go through uh, job opportunities and, and get real salaries, and uh this is what we all need. It's, it's, it's not just a civil right. It's a human right. Do you feel that David will be okay after, you know, you and your husband are no longer around? Or do you still worry about it? I worry. But I think all parenting is fraught. It's just uh, when you have a child or a young adult with special needs, the stressors are different. It's the sheer watchfulness and the um, what will happen next feeling. But we, we all feel that way about our children, don't we? I just wonder who will be there to see that he gets home at night and will there be a chaste and loving touch? Will there be someone who cares as much as I do about him? Do you think he'll ever get married? I don't know. I don't know. It's hard without that empathy piece, though. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. It's, you see, I suppose there's not a, a whole lot of planning ahead we can do on the emotional side. We can hire an attorney, attorney to help us with special needs trust, uh, but that's, that's financial. There's a whole other piece to this puzzle that is uh, um, unknown. David does want to live on his own, though, doesn't he? Yes, he does. We were talking about it just last night at dinner. And what did, what did you guys say? Well, he'd like to live with a cat 
and he'd like to have an apartment of his own. We've talked about maybe a roommate, and he says, no, he'd prefer to live alone. So, And what's stopping that? Money. Uh, he's got to be able to pay for it himself. You know, Glenn, as a society, we're starting to come to terms with these numbers, one in 50 children. So it seems that there's a lot of advocacy going on for kids and education going on about autism, but not a lot about what we do with all these kids that become adults. What do we do as a society with so many autistic adults? Well, that's the thing. These kids are growing up. And right now, the figure is something like 750,000 kids, and it's growing. We, we got the new figures from the CDC just recently um, that, that show it's more like 2% of the population of young school-age children are diagnosed somewhere along the, the spectrum. Um, so we, we're going to have to pay attention, and, and the attention needs to be to young uh, families with autistic children who need um, equal access to health care and also supports in housing for young adults uh, so they can learn to live on their own, give them the dignity of risk. And um, let's see, uh, so they fail. We've all failed. Failure is a terrific learning tool. It's worked for me many times. Let's see what it does as far as um, trusting that these, these young adults should have private lives of their own. There's a lot of um, pressure on government spending these days, as probably in the near future it's, it's going to be. Uh, there's a lot of programs out there that are very worthy. Make the case that the government needs to pay attention to this issue and to put some resources behind it. On average, autism costs a family more than $50,000 annually. That's what Autism Speaks says. There is a total NIH budget of over $30 billion, but only 0.6% of that goes toward funding autism research. We've got to do better. In a country that says everyone counts, this is unacceptable. Glenn Finland, she's the author of the book called Next Stop, An Autistic Son Grows Up. It's published by Putnam Books. Glenn, thanks so much for being on the program. Thank you. Support for this program is provided by Minnesota Life College. Wondering about the next step after high school? At Minnesota Life College, young adults with learning differences and autism spectrum disorders learn to live independently. More information is at minnesotalifecollege.org. Let's continue the conversation. You can like us on Facebook, and you can follow me on Twitter. I'm at Mimi Gerges. That's M-I-M-I-G-E-E-R-G-E-S. You can find those social media links on our website, mgshow.org, and you can also hit the contact button and send me an email. I respond to all listener emails. 